Happy Sunday, apprentices. When you're alone with your significant other, do you start on the top or the bottom? That's what's next on today's show. Trading Forex or any other financial instrument carries substantial risk. The topics discussed on this show are the views of the host and the producers only. You should consult with your financial planner before investing in Forex or any other financial instrument. Don't be a dumbass. Welcome to the Day Trading Palmer episode 47. I'm Matt Simpson, but nah, you're not here for me. Dude, five more, it's been a year, right? Five more weeks. Is that how math works? I'm, I am i don't know. Yeah. We don't more. really do math in the trading world. No, we just pick uh, lines. I, <laughs> shapes and colors and lines. Right. Super shapes. If you have a three-year-old kid, you know what that's from. It's funny you say that because I, I was actually in a heated debate once on one of these uh, Forex Facebook groups where uh, someone threw it out there. It's like, what facet of mathematics do you think trading is more about? Like, is it ratios? Is it geometry? Is it algebra? And, you know, it got it was a pretty heated topic. Some people are like, it's geometry. That's a great question, though. Yeah, it, it was, and I never really thought of it that way because you do use geometry, but, it's, you know, I I had a hard one with that because you're not drawing, you know, part of your strategy is it, uh, you need to be isosceles triangle, and then that's the buy. Like, even like Elliott Wave, A, B, C, D uh, strategies, we're not calculating angles. You're drawing lines. And probabilities, I would say simple math is probably more predominant because you got to be able to quickly calculate. I still struggle at it with even the micro pips, right? The fractional pip. You should get to where you can calculate, you know, add and subtract. You know, if you're shorting, subtract, calculate pretty quick the pips. But the tools they give you nowadays, it's just as easy. I've gotten lazy and just grabbed the ruler. Ah, oh, 50 pips. <laughs> Quite honestly, simple math. You've seen me use the Fibonacci retracement tool. I mean, if I had to calculate that out, yeah, all right. Now we're getting to some comp complicated math, but someone's already done it for you. They've given you a nice little tool. You just draw a line from A to B, and pfft, there it is. So... I don't know. I don't think you have to be that great at math to get it. In the world of process improvement, people who aren't in it and people who aren't management seriously think, and we'll ask you, are you just drawing shapes and colors and lines and filling them in? Yep. That's all I do all day. Uh, why would shapes and colors be? A well, because you have decision trees and you have a decision matrix and you have diamonds and triangles and rectangles uh, and circles for stars and you have ports into people seriously think that you just get paid to draw all day. Well, it, that's cool. You know, like Microsoft Visio or a better process program. Yeah. You lost me with Microsoft Visio. All right. So, uh, <laughs> I see you. Uh, you wore another goofy shirt tonight. It's not goofy. Uh, blame Canada for Nickelback. I mean, yeah, I right. like Nickelback. Look at this photograph. Remember that song? Look at the yeah. It was a uh, Trump tweet made it pretty popular. Every time I do, it makes me gag. Where did all of your hair go? Are you looking at? Are you talking to me? Why the hell won't my beard grow? <laughs> are you singing to me, Matt? Um, Just in case you were wondering who Nickelback was. They had a good seven-year run, bud. Uh, I I don't know why Nickelback has such a – kind of like Crow. Creed? Creed. <laughs> I liked Creed. Well, that's because you're an idiot. I liked Creed songs. It's butt rock from the 2000s, dude. I get it, dude. You, you metalheads are like, they're posers, bro. 
it's kind of like Millie Vanilli, but which everyone does what Millie Vanilli was doing back then now. Yeah, that's become a whole thing, by the way. And yeah, sh- finally, sh- people are starting to call out uh, in, in a MySpace, in my realm, the rock realm, the metal uh, space. People are starting to get called out, and I love it. It's great to see. But in pop, it's dead. Everything you're watching is a fucking mime. Yeah, it's crazy because... You might as well just go to a karaoke you know, if, bar at that if, point. If anyone deserves reper- reper- tish- rep- reparations. reparations, it's Melly Vanilli, right? They were done wrong. Their careers were trashed. I mean, Mariah Carey they made was, their money though. Mariah Carey was lip syncing on New Year's Eve. It was so fantastic to watch. <laughs> God, wasn't that just a train wreck? And then, and then she came back the next year, and I guess the uh, audio engineer got it right. But yeah, that was so awesome to dude, watch. Dude, she train wrecked. I had so much joy watching. And it was that. just like, uh, 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 which is too uh, bad because I loved her in '94. Yeah, I had a crush on her. Oh, dude. Top-down analysis. The pros, the cons, the good, the bad, the ugly. I had a tough time today thinking about this because I do it. Lots of traders do it. It's one of the things that we're taught you need to do. Not every trader does it right. And I, I, I'd even put myself in that classification because it's no secret. I'm struggling right now with my own trading I'm struggling to get the motivation to put it on and get that confidence when you put that trade on and and just know it's going to go where it's supposed to go. So, you know, one of the things I'm looking at is how I'm doing my top-down chart analysis. And for those of you that don't know, top-down charting analysis is where you're switching from a longer range time frame, say like a daily to four hour to one hour. You're trying to get perspective, right? You're trying to get a feel for the market because if you've been doing this long enough, you know the trend on the daily could be down, but on the hourly, it's a strong uptrend. So, you know, when you hear these cliches like trade with the trend, well, which trend do I follow? That's what we're going to kind of delve into today. See how I'd even pause on that? I just went right delve. Right. It was a little bit of a pause, but only I heard it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure our listeners heard it too. What we need to do is I want to look at this with a sharper pencil because a lot of our listeners listen to other people or watch YouTube videos. And, you know, we got to clarify it a little bit. The way I look at it, if the daily trend is up, or whatever, whatever you're looking at on a daily chart, you got to kind of start to work that top-down analysis into whatever trading strategy you're working with. For instance, if I'm doing the 15-minute Bollinger Band strategy that I teach all the time in the channel, or we do back testing on it, and it always seems to come up because it's, it's, it's a great strategy. If I look at the daily chart, it might start throwing me off biasly or I might start to add filters, right? We talked about that today on the, the AMA to ask me anything of it that I do every Thursday, an hour before we record this, it might throw you off. Or if you add it, you could use it as a filter and be like, okay, if the daily trend is down, I'm only going to look for sell trades. So those are things that people can do. Now, what a lot of new traders do is they bounce back and forth between time frames. And if you find yourself doing that only to convince yourself to force yourself into a trade, you're not doing it right. I get caught up when I'm doing a, a extensive top-down analysis, when I'm in the, a phase like I'm in now where I'm unsure That's when I start to kind of ditch that aspect of my trading. I try to focus on a strategy. I try to focus on maybe one or two timeframes. If I'm scalping, it's going to be like 15 minute, five minute. And I don't want to know what the daily says at that point. Those strategies, those probabilities are built into that. If I'm looking at swing trades, I might want to look at the daily four hour and enter on a one hour. 
And what a lot of people get caught doing is if they're not focused, they just find themselves randomly jumping back and forth through the time frames and just get all analysis paralysis up because you could talk yourself into anything and you could talk yourself out of anything if you stare at something long enough. Lately, I've just been talking myself out of everything. And then once I go, oh, 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 I'm impatient. I've been watching it. Boom, I'm in. And then it just seems like the four X gods are like, ha ha, Clayton got in. Let's move 100 pips against him and really test his patience. I mean, you've done a little bit. What time frame do you like the most? Or do four you have hours. A four hour? Four hours is a very popular run. I've been really looking at, I'm creating a new strategy around daily candles because just the way my life is right now, I could really, I really have a lot of time at the financial end of the day so I could study the daily candle for the day pretty well. And I've started to see, hey, every time this certain candle shows up, which call it a pin bar, call it doji, whatever, you know, Cobra Kai camp you went to. <laughs> I'm wrapping a strategy around it where I'm back testing it now, but now I could enter off the four hour chart. You're looking at daily chart, looking for a certain pattern with daily candle and you wait for the trigger on the four hour. And a lot of strategies are wrapped around that. You wait for X on the this time frame. And then you go down to this time frame and wait for that price action trigger. I mean, now you're starting to get really scoped in to, you know, the more uh, I've been spending time with equities traders, just uh, to let our listeners know, I opened a TD Ameritrade Think or Swim paper account the other day. And I've taken some of their classes the last few days that they offer for free on there. I've been listening to this audiobook called The One Good Trade by Mike Bellafori. Bellafor? The E is silent. Bellafiore. 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 How'd you know I'm Italian? But I've been listening to that, and he's the founder, co founder of SB Capital, one of the largest day trading prop firms out there. And it just, it kind of sparked my interest because he talks about the characters in his firm and what they look for in prop traders and the preciseness that, like, he talks about precision. Precision. That he talk, <laughs> that he talks about with his traders, you know, getting down to like the scent on the entry and the exit, and uh, if they admit like today I shorted Netflix, and I felt pretty proud of myself because I'm like, okay, I did my analysis. It's a little bit of technical, a little bit of fundamental, which you know in equities fundamentals are a little bit more of a play than they are in. In Forex, some people are going to write into the show and be like, you're an idiot. The uh, fundamentals are huge in Forex. Not, not the way I trade. But equities, fundamentals are a big part of it, right? I'm looking at their earnings. I'm looking at when their earnings report comes out, which was today, which in my screener that I use on finviz.com, on the screener, I look for stocks that has earnings coming out this week, right? So I start targeting and I'm like, okay, Netflix went on this amazing, ridiculous bullish run through COVID. Well, me being a reversion of mean trader, naturally, I start looking for that short opportunity. So today I'm like, okay, earnings is coming out. Today, uh, the overnight futures showed bearish. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to short it. And I got in perfect, or at least I thought it was a good entry. Where me and uh, S and B Capital traders are differ. It, I I got out 
you know, I took my two grand and I was like, hey, man, I'm good. Which, you know, like I say on here all the time, don't beat yourself up for making money. But I got out, I, I short at like 530, even number, imagine that, which there's big superstition in the equities traders world about even numbers. And closed it at like 519. Well, it went to 449, which was like the call, short call level. And there's a lot of analysts when I was in that trade saying, oh, 449 is the buy target, which normally I should have held. But it was just interesting. You know, it's interesting because that's what's kind of driven me to kind of do a little bit more trading of equities rather than investing. And, you know, if I'm going to have a day trading podcast, I probably should be a little bit more well-rounded in the subject matter. But it's interesting to listen to that book. I mean, his, these traders, you know, kick themselves in the balls for missing half a point on a move. The whole premise of the book is you make one good trade and then you make another good trade. And it's just funny how he talks about the characters and how they grow as traders when they're in like this cubicle farm of all the other traders. And you know, one of the best qualities you can have is being competitive. Cause like in their firm, it's like we go after ex athletes, you know, we want competitive. We'll teach you how to trade, but you need to be competitive, right? You got to want to win. You got to know how to win. And it, there's a lot of truth to it because like when I'm trading, like right now I'm struggling, struggling with my Forex trades because I'm not confident, right? I know when I have that juice that when I'm putting that trade on, I know when it's going to work. Lately, it's been like, oh, please, please, please don't be a bad one. Oh, it's a bad one, <laughs> right? And it's like I've fallen right back into when I was a young, just starting out trader, when you, you don't have all this knowledge and experience to lean on. And you're just like, kind of feel like you're just aimlessly throwing darts at a wall. And you're like, hey, it worked. Right? Like my the equities trades. Because here's what I'm really trying to do with the equities account. No more than six trades a day, which I haven't done more than three. And I'm in and out that day. So if it's getting down to close, it's a losing position, I just close it. Because I'm truly trying to follow the credo or code of a day trader with this equities account. So I'm looking for intraday only moves in and out. Doing my analysis before the open, just like a trader would, right? I'm amazed at the vast amount of options I have to trade. We're like Forex. Oh, I got 28 currency pairs. I could get through those charts pretty quick. That's why I was like, oh, I found Finviz with a great screener on it. Hi, Camilla. Just uh, answering you on Telegram. Thanks for reaching out. What are you talking about? Camilla, hit me up. Oh, as we're recording? Yeah, as we're recording. Say hi, hey, Camilla. Camilla. How's it going? Yeah, I use that screener and I'm starting to try to make my own strategies, right? I screen which, which stocks have earnings reports this week because that's going to cause volatility. I'm not telling myself I'm going to short any of them, but then I start looking, what's the consensus? What do people think? What does the technical analysis tell me, right? Is it overbought, oversold, overbought? Right now, I'm just at that early stage where it's like, well, I know it's going to move. These are going to move. I kind of made a stupid move today. I found a, a biotech stock or a healthcare stock that dropped like 180% overnight <laughs> because, again, fundamental, right? The FDA did not approve some miracle drug that you know has been boosting their stock so it went from like 27 down to like nine so i was like you know what it's been bullish this whole year and maybe we'll get a big bullish bounce 
And that was the only one I left open on the overnight, but I bought it at like nine. It dropped to seven today. You know, 22%. Yeah, it was, it was a considerable drop. And then, uh, you know, it was 40 bucks. I lost. I'm in a losing position. I got $40 drawdown. And I'm learning in the equities trading, you know, it's a little bit different how they say what drawdown is. You don't get penalized for that drawdown. There's no swap. No, there's no swap. And for some reason on my winning trades, when I close them, it's like I got paid a premium or something. I got to figure it out. Yeah, it's all Greek to me. It's funny because, you you know, these 50-year-old kids that have a Robinhood account, like, yeah, man, I'm a fucking trader. And you're like, dude, you have no idea. <laughs> you just hit buy on Robinhood and the stock went up and you're a trader now. <laughs> Yeah, it, there's a lot more to it. And, you know, it's just like when I got into Forex and a lot of my equities friends are like, dude, you trade Forex, it's, you're crazy. For me, equities, because I've spent very little time in the last decade because I wanted to focus on one thing, very little time on it. You know, there's options, you can trade futures. You know, there's just, it, it's like this endless abyss of- Indices. And to see, you know, it's just endless abyss of things you could trade on. Then there's, you know, puts or calls. And then, you know, it's just a whole new language. And it's, you know, I think it's about time I at least search down the rabbit hole enough to where I, I know what I'm talking about. You know, because believe it or not, you run into someone at a party. And you're like, yeah, I trade Forex. Like, what do you think on that up? Uh, what do you think of WTI on the bullish run it's been on? I'm like, I don't trade stocks, bro. <laughs> What's Forex? Foreign exchange currency market. Pfft. So what? You just buy money and you sell money back? You know, it's, it's, it is funny how many people. And what I noticed on my thinkorswim, there's an FX. There's a whole FX oh, yeah. thing on there. In purchasing, they think that you just send an order off. And then you just move on to the next one. So I get it. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of guilty of that. It's like make like a tree and leave and buy my crap and just get it here on time. Stop calling me. Just get the shit. <laughs> it's a three minute transaction all around. Yep. I know. Well, what's funny is in the early days of our trade before prefab, before shop ordered your shit. It was kind of set up like purchasing agents were like, they were almost like admin esque positions for you. Right? It was like, you're the big bad journeyman foreman on the job. Your job is to get this job done. And construction's all about timing. And we didn't have sophisticated P6 scheduling software back then. Quite honestly, I don't think anyone had a computer on a construction site when I started. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have PEs and PMs on site. Like, the MO was like, your PM was someone you never saw. Project manager. Project, project manager, engineer. project engineer. And your purchasing agent had unicators, right? Because we had two-way radios. So it was like, hey, Gary, I need a 60... <laughs> I need a uh, 60 90s. And he'd be like, all right, man, I'll just, I'll have it ready and I will call. And, you know, it was just like, or I need a PO. Ordering one item at a time. And he's like, well, what do you want on the PO? Just open PO. Open PO, yeah. Which is like the. I, I'm just going to go pick it up. Dude, you can never <laughs> get an open PO in your lifetime now. And I just remember being like, uh, I call wholesale. Just go over there and get it get whatever you need just make sure they send me the list and you know us in the field we got really reliant on that because i remember when that habit had to get broken the pushback how can they possibly think we need to order everything for the next two weeks i got 90 guys on this job i was there for that do they even have a clue how fucking hard it is out here and what's funny is when I became, you know, high level manager in the same space, I demand it, right? Like 
when I took over that small mechanical company after my my uh, hotel engineering stint, it was like I went back in time. Uh, give me a PO, and they had pipe racks on their truck, right? And I was like, why? Why superintendents need pipe racks? Well, they, they got to pick material. No, pff. no, you've spent all this money on this overhead, this office called purchasing. Take the trucks away because I need them on the site. It, it, if you're a superintendent and if you're a young plumber or anyone in the plumbing field space out there listening to us, if you are inkling into management, if you can't think a week ahead, there's something wrong. You're not a manager. Right. Sorry. You, you're not there yet. Like I used to tell my superintendents, you're like a crew runner. You need someone to still hold your hands. We're out of B. We're at, no more B takes. Really, dude? Go fuck it. Go home then. Really? I, well, I need to get my hours. You're gonna pay me to go home? No. You ran yourself out of gas. Go. <laughs> you know, I used to just grind my gears because it's like they would be like, "Uh, we're out of half inch nineties. How do you run out of half inch nineties when you're water piping?" 1100 room hotel dude you buy half inch 90s by the box right because you don't ever say i need 493 well, half inch 90s you say i need five boxes well then you get here right i'll tell you a story i had this foreman we won't name names when i was building the colorado supreme court here okay he was one of my foreman i put him in charge of one of the water pipe crews the overhead water pipe not even in wall and we were, our prefab was on point, this job. So really. For once. Yeah, because I, I put a lot of energy into it beforehand. So it was on schedule, not a lot of rework. And so you got to imagine 95% of this guy's materials already been ordered, already been managed, already been labeled. Damn near has a freaking barcode on it that goes, beep, here. Right. So he has to order the hanger, you know, the the cow blocks in the all thread in case you gotta move hangers and not a lot. Right? So I go walk the floor. I look at all this pipe hanging in there. Not one cow block. Right? And at the time we we're using zap it's or whatever. Snap it's snap it's where you it's an insulation block you put to hold the pipe center in your hanger so that when the insulator comes he just ties to it so none of those are in just just it's not finished right and he's moved up to the next floor out just slamming production pipe and i'm like what are you doing well the schedule says we gotta be up here i'm like yeah i know you should be up here but you're not done downstairs oh well i like to order them all after i could count them after the pipe's up so, uh, and then I'll just go back and I'm like, what? No, you need to have that in that man's hands when he goes up the ladder. So it's done. Why would you go back and get on a lat? <laughs> so then he, you know, he got, we had the heated argument. He's like, well, how am I supposed to how, know how many? I'm like, yeah. take an estimate, dude. You, you know, there's a hanger every 10 feet. So if you're calculating how many feet are on a floor, you could get close. You know, there's a mathematical way to get close. And, you know, we prefabbed our hangers. So just look at the damn hanger count. We get that argument. Well, what's he do? He goes and orders like 20,000 of them. <laughs> <All that. laughs> Prefabbing a hanger is taking the all thread, cutting it, and screwing it into the clubhouse hanger and nutting it up. You're like that little bubble thing on those books for dummies. It's like, oh, if you want to know what prefab hanger is, go to the bottom of the page. <laughs> so he orders 20,000 of these. And then, like, I see the truck show up. Beep, beep, beep. And then, like, the material handler's, like, unloading. I'm like, what in the hell? Crate after crate. Yeah, and then I'm like... Hangers. He's like, well, you said I got to get them all. I'm like, so you just order out of spite 20,000 of them? Yeah. I'm like, dude, 
how many did you use on floor one? And it's a 12 story building. Like, even a dumbass, let's say you used a thousand on one floor, it's 12,000, right? You might be close. And, and I mind you, the pipe sizes all change. So you got to kind of go, how many one inch? How many inch and a quarter? He orders 20,000 one inch. And he just tells me, well, we'll just carve out the middle of it. I'm like, ah. Oh. Carve out the middle of them? Yeah. So needless to say, I had to kick him off the job, return him all, do it myself. And then, you know, you get pennies on the dollar when you return it. And you, you know, it's a, you know, you're, imper- it's a managing nightmare. I match it back to the piano. You call the vendor and they're like, we shipped them in from Singapore with that size of order. We can't take them back. It'll take us 20 years to sell that. What a mess. How this relates to your top down analysis on charting. You need to look at the big picture. You need to see the story from, ah, it's 12 story building. Ah, uh, you know, on the one minute chart, floor one, it's looking bullish. What's it say on the top? Now, you got to kind of take all these data points to get to pretty close. And what do I say in trading? The whole thing's super precise. So we feel like we got to be precise. Now, I sound like an idiot because these S- S&B capital traders apparently are very precise on their entries and exits, or at least they were portrayed to be in the book. However, guys, to be successful in trading, you don't have to be that precise. You lower your trade size. You plant the seed in a highly probable area, especially Forex. Forex will move around. You plant it, it just wait. Like I I was saying uh, last week in the AMI, if you enter on a retest of like a double top, we're predicting a double top. So we enter right when it hits that level and it goes a little bit above it. Or even if it just keeps going, odds are if it blows through that level you entered at, it's going to retest. You just got to be patient enough for it to come back. And then you better have the balls to take to close your trade at break even or with a really small loss on that retest. Having good technical sound analysis skills helps you when you're in a bad trade too because it helps you know when you got to get out. It helps you when you're a good trade too. Like uh, tonight when I was explaining to Brandon, he was long Australian dollar Swiss franc. It was in a bullish flag pattern and he's probably went through a little bit of hell today because it was, oh, it's profitable. Oh, it's bad. Oh, it's profitable because it's bounding in that the high and low of that flag. And, you know, I was telling him in the beginning of the AMA, look, you might go a little bit and draw down again, but you don't have to worry until it breaks through that flag down. And then, you know, your next possible target is probably the 618 fib line or, you know, give it a chance to blow through that flag line. It's a bullish flag. You know, a lot of traders will wait until it's, it blows through to enter. Me and the way I trade, I'll enter a bullish flag on the backside channel. So then I'm getting gains through the channel. I get a lot of criticism. Well, you're just gambling at that point. Well, no, I'm not gambling. I'm taking a buy trade on the bottom of a support channel. It's a sound technical assessment. And I'm giving myself, you know, an out. If it bounces on the top channel, I'm already in a small profitable trade and I could choose to take that profit and get out. We make things really difficult on ourselves. For instance, the foreman. Overthinking, how can I possibly get the exact number? You know, because, you know, his argument to me is like, well, I don't want to over order. So you just don't order at all? Is there a relationship to be made when examining ordering materials? And what I mean is, obviously, you can't order a whole job at once. And this happened this week. I would you, say you, you could get about 90%. Yes, but you can schedule the release. But you can't, right. you can't have all the materials no. show up at once. But what happened this week on a job is we had to move all of the hangers up a week. So now I have to stop everything. This is the job. This is the industry. Okay, fine. 
stop everything. I've, now I have to be nice, which I don't like to be nice. <laughs> so now they have leverage on you. Correct. Because you're like, hey, you know those 9,000 hangers, PO 1059er, that I said we needed on the 24th? Well, now I need them next week. Now I need them tomorrow. Okay. Okay. I know that it's impossible for them to have it. But I also know that we can't have nothing because now we're sending guys home. And you can't send guys home more than once every year because they won't come back when you call them back. Is that fair? Well, as the operations manager, here's the question I would ask. Why do we have to move it up a week? I don't know. I'm not here to answer those questions. All Is there I, a change order? I don't know. That, would, would that help you if I called you and went, hey, Matt, purchasing agent, buddy, old pal, you know those POs we set up for delivery on this schedule that I brought you in right. to our, our download of the schedule so you, you can feel like you're part of the team, which I did all the time with my purchasing agents. Yep. Here is my, we got, I call it a man-loaded schedule, and it tied to all my material too. And then if there's a drastic change, like, Nine guys either go home or they put up hangers on level three a week early. I would be like, okay, GC, you're accelerating schedule. Now Matt has an eight hour overtime. And then my vendor, he may not have them, but I might have to pay a, bit, a higher price point now to move it up. Correct. Because if, if I know that we're now making more margin, I can now source it. And I know that there's, right. there's a bit of a premium that I now have wiggle room to afford. Yes. Isn't it funny how like foremen or even PMs for that matter, don't even look at that overhead cost or that as they're sitting in that, that trailer on the construction site. And that GC's like, God damn uh, framer got kicking ass up there. I want to see plumbers up there tomorrow. Damn it. And you're like, we're not scheduled to next week. Well, God damn it, get more guys. And you're like, uh, sorry, dude. That More guys means more money, material speeding up. I know I'm going off on a tangent, but it used to just piss me off. That PMs when it chase cost. We had to move. Well, that's why purchasing is its own profession. We, Love her. <laughs> we had to move today or this week. We had to move hangers up a full week. Okay, fine. Let me make a call. Now I have to be nice. Now I have to smile over the phone because they can hear you smile. Anyway, I know that the vendor isn't going to be able to get it all there. But I also know that if we can get him something to get him right. going, that will keep them moving. Well, I got the 12-inch roller hangers. Right. Fuck, I don't want to do those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for 12-inch pipe yet. Yes. Yeah, I, I get it. And those things are heavy. But I know that we can get them going. And I, and I also know through experience that that order will change by the time it's completed in two deliveries later. Right. That, that order will have changed. Because now they're actually doing the task, and they'll be like, oh, my God, Matt, I forgot about 40, uh, three and a half. And, and I accept that. But I know that if I, I just need to get them going. Is there something to be said for being in the trade or in the position ready to trade and getting things done, moving positions, moving – well, the data is moving. You're getting more information for that. Is there something to be said for being in it? Yeah, I mean, like we talk about all the time, manage your trades, just like a job. I went through this a lot when I was teaching the superintendents at my former, the last company, because they had no concept of planning when I got there. Zero. Shocker. Right? So I gained their confidence and respect because you know i i don't ever do what i don't can't back up so i created mls you don't ever say what you can't back up i don't ever say what i can't back up or i'm not going to tell you do something i haven't done right. so i dumbed down the far advanced system i built at the at global mechanical i dumbed it down to a simple spreadsheet of what are you doing Monday? I'm like, well, we're going to set that. that. Well, the schedule, you know, it starts with, what does the schedule say you're going to do? Right? And they're like, well, no, we don't have any schedule activity IDs. And I'm like, eh, 
That's where you go wrong. If you are fully reliant on the GC to tell you exactly what you need to be doing, then you're not a superintendent. What you got to be looking at is all the predecessor activities that you should know if you're running a job as a plumber because the GC doesn't know. And if you're waiting for them to schedule your grease interceptor, it's just gonna, they're just going to throw it in after the concrete or something, right? So it's your job to go, look, and how this relates to trading is you're doing technical analysis. That's the schedule plan. If price breaks this trend line and retests at this level, I'm going to enter a sell trade. If the dirt work gets done on Tuesday and they're cleaned up and out by Friday, I should expect to have a crew there on Monday starting to dig the underground. You're always looking at the predecessor activity as your, your technical analysis of the trade. Now you're in it. You started the underground. For you, your your analogy, the job started. They got men on site, so now they're burning cash. Your trade's on. It's either negative or positive. And when you start that job, you're either ahead of margin or behind margin. You're either meeting your hours quota. And I don't I could probably count on one hand of the two hundred undergrounds I've been in charge of that we've ever been ahead money-wise on undergrounds. Call it uh, not a lack of effort. I think just a lack of pricing effort because undergrounds are always underpriced. There's always a dinosaur in the ground. You got to dig around. There's always a soldier beam that, oh, that's from the building before. And it's not an art contract to remove it. And you're like, I got a 12-inch main that goes through it. That's your problem. Adds three days with eight guys. You're blowing your budget. Either way, you're in the trade. You're in the job. So you're managing that trade. GC changed the schedule. I got to get the hangers here earlier. When you're in the trade, it's the same thing. You're using everything, your knowledge base and, and technical analysis. Maybe it's fundamental. Do I stay in this trade or do I get out? It's always that question, just like Brandon today in the AMA. He's in a good trade, but he's second-guessing himself. He's wondering if he should get out or not, out or not. And that's that's the battle most people don't realize when they start trading. It all, I guess, like I always say, everyone puts all the focus on that one decision, buy or sell. But they're not preparing themselves for the torment and all the decisions you're going to be making after. It's just like when I used to run projects or teaching young superintendents how to run projects. We put all this energy into that game plan, the playbook. You know, we call it MLS, man loaded schedule. It also tied to when we're releasing material. It's how it's the one tool I have to communicate to you, be like, Here's where I think I'm going to need 900 two-inch sleeves because they're pouring the deck. And, it, and mind you, it's a year and a half out. We're going to be pouring level eight here. Here's a rough takeoff of the sleeves, but we're not catted yet. It's not finalized. But I owe you a rough estimate so we could start comparing bid material so I, I want to know if I'm going to be over on material from the bid early on because I could good project managers want to know if there's a hole somewhere early. Those of you uh, on the other side, so we could change order you to death when you try to add a floor sink, right? I need to know where the holes are. And it's just, it's so funny to me that people who want to be the boss so bad or want to be the superintendent so bad. They have no idea like, okay, well now you want to be the man running the job. Well, I want to know within 95% of all the material you're going to order on this job a year and a half before you order it. What? Well, estimating should have those. That's the cheating part, right? Because 
I had a lot of super tits, but we'll give you the QuickBooks. No, I know what the estimating thinks because it's in the bid. I want to know you because I used to tell them if, if you sit down and you force yourself to measure every foot of pipe, count the hangers, and, and systematically try to make that process efficient, one, you'll never have to look at the prints again. You'll know I'm like the back of your hands. Two, you'll start to see how the puzzles go together. Oh, I'm really going to write a check today for 90,000 feet of pipe. How accurate do you think I was? And, you know, technology's come a long way. I used to have to wheel it off. Now I just blue beam it. Love the wheel. Yeah. And then you realize some asshole changed the scale on you when you went oh. to the bathroom. And you're like, man, these floors are just astronomically bigger the last floor was 10,000 now I'm 40,000 feet some dickhead hit the button now it's one eighth scale <laughs> what do you think is currently the most crowded trade I'll run down a list long yield curve steepeners long cash long corporate bonds long gold uh -huh. long US tech stocks US tech stocks we're in a little bit of bubble I think Tech was an easy safe haven for COVID. Amazon, Google, the Russell's really bit small caps been a, a kind of popping lately, which is good. I want I, I want to see small caps pop. Uh, I think gold. I don't know. I think the separation, the correlation between gold and the dollar, are finally starting to show based on the $3.2 trillion that we printed. The dollar's finally starting to weaken, and gold is finally... I actually bought some gold today, and I, you know it was funny because I, when I opened up my trading view chart, I did like a gold analysis back in like August 2018, and I was like, it's going to go to 1800 I know it is. And it was at like 1200 then. Today it's at 1805 I was a year off because I actually was like, it's going to go to 1800. I thought recession was going to hit March 2018 ish. And then uh, March 2019 is pretty heavy uh, trade war dilemma. Then you got March 2020. Oh, we're just three year delayed on the, the uh, 10 year credit cycle. My boy Bernhard Warner at Fortune. Maybe it's Bernhard Warner at Fortune. Did you mispronounce the name, dude? Well, he's American, but sometimes you forget which the German pronounce anyway. Okay. 74% uh, of fund managers said U.S. tech stocks are the most crowded trade out there these days. That's according to Bank of America's latest fund manager survey. 74% have long U.S. tech stocks as overtraded. That leaves 26% to be split up among gold, cash, corporate bonds, and yield curve steepeners, according to these hedge fund managers, which is really interesting because... I think gold's going to be a big play. NASDAQ has been tech heavy, and we've been watching NASDAQ, and it's NASDAQ, and it's been at 10,000 yeah. now. It's, it's been holding at 10,000. Because let's think about the, the emotional side of the market. The market's emotions when you're right in a trade what's next you hold it you hold it and then what eventually you're gonna go uh i better get out so where's that level of fuck i mean hedge fund manager it's over overbought 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 so when they start selling that they gotta put it somewhere else especially hedge fund managers and huge portfolio managers. You know, they got to be in trades. Otherwise, they're not growing, right? Famous quote from Tommy Boy, you're either growing or dying. When this NASDAQ run is over, I'm not saying it's now, but where are they going to pull that and put it? That's where the early investor right now needs to be focusing. You miss the run on NASDAQ. Don't be the sheep that buys at the top. It's a lot easier cliches in equities. It's easier to see fundamentally. Forex is 
it has the same type of emotion. But man, there like I said, there's no buy and hold strategies, right, in Forex. You can't just I'm buying British pound cat and I'm gonna hold that bitch till I retire. It just does uh, and there is those opportunities like in the class I took today on TD Ameritrade, it was about income investing, dividend stocks, how to spread it out through cash. You know, I'm soaking it all up now. And, you know, I learned a lot, but it's like, look, you, you stay away from this. You look for these patterns on a thing and it's very intriguing. But if you really start like, you, if you really start to break down, you don't need to know math. You don't need to know all this fancy shit. It's just like we're above the highs of all time. Do you want to buy? Right? Like milk is at an all time high right now. If you did not need milk, you didn't have kids at home, you hated cereal or whatever, and you knew there's a chance it could possibly go down 50% in a, in a week. Would you wait that week? That's really what people got to be asking themselves. Should I buy tech stocks? Fuck, I just missed the last run. Uh, I, I don't know. But how many people have done that? I, I was really pissed at myself for selling my position in Tesla. In the, I thought I was the coolest dude when I bought it in like the low twos. I sold it at the fours. It's fucking 1300 now. That was like last year. Speaking of Robinhood, we talked about retail traders and your 15-year-old traders. Janelle Marte of Reuters wrote an article, Americans on COVID-19 jobless benefits spent more than when working, study shows. Of course they did. But Why? they got more time. Well, it's also not their money. right? I, I see an interesting trend today of all the essential workers. You knew this was coming, right? We're essential. You Until keep telling Well, you keep telling us we're essential. You care about us. Starbucks is giving us free coffee or whatever, you know, for nurses, not plumbers, by the way. Starbucks, shame on you. But all these essential workers are like, well, fuck, you're going to add $600 a week to my paycheck? That's right. We're the ones making the world go around. From the article, Americans who received enhanced unemployment benefits due to the coronavirus pandemic spent more than when they were working, a study released on Thursday said, adding to concerns about a steep fall in spending when the emergency benefits expire. Again, it's not their money. It's everybody's money, right? Let's just, let's just face it. If you win $1,000, say you take 20 bucks to Blackhawk or Vegas if you're uh -huh. not from Colorado, and you win 1000 bucks on it. Are you really going to go put that in your bank? The $600 weekly supplement added to jobless benefits as part of the CARES Act helped unemployed households spend 10% more after receiving benefits than they did before the pandemic. Researchers analyzed transactions for 61,000 households that received unemployment benefits between March and May. Spending dropped for all households as the virus spread and led to business shutdowns, but then rose when households began receiving jobless benefits. Remember, there was a lag. Right. More Fear... Oh, we're getting money now. More than 30 million Americans are estimated to be receiving unemployment benefits. And they could be pushed off an income cliff when the supplemental benefits, which are due to expire at the end of July, this is a couple of weeks now, are withdrawn. Households that had to wait several weeks for the first unemployment check to arrive cut spending by about 20%, the study found. Spending recovered after the checks arrived. America has a spending problem. Right. But it is that willingness, like we talked about, is that willingness to take that debt, to take on that debt that has actually helped the economy right. grow, grow faster I mean, because people are willing so, to take risks, especially Americans. We we well, take a tremendous amount of risk. Do you think for an instant, when they were approving this six hundred dollars, they didn't already know how American spending habits are? Of course they do. It wasn't Matt, I'm gonna you're out of work. We're going to give you $600 more because we care about you. They know you're not going to put that in a savings account and hoard it. Right? It's just like the $1,200. I bet you if we take a poll on our listeners on this show, 
Uh, what'd you spend it on? It wasn't in your bank account. It's not, no one, no one has it still, right? It was stimulus and they know when they gave you that money, it was, it was the boost, the numbers. And, and I agree with it. However, we've got some serious fundamental problems with this. Now I know at least five people that refuse to go back to work and using the COVID scare thing is like, is it safe? Just because they're they're making more money not working. Here's the problem with that. Here's why that is so short sighted. Because not everybody is built like that. All the jobs that are coming open will be filled with good people. With good people who aren't relying on a check that they didn't earn. So when those checks run out, there are going to be no jobs or fewer jobs for those people to now go earn. Right. And and there are people who, even though they are making more, they have to work because they have to have a sense of accomplishment. They have to have some pride in, in earning their way. They're going to take a step down and they might become managers at restaurants or you know take a step down in other kinds of pay because they want to work. They don't want to depend on anybody for anything ever. So even at that level, at the lower wage level, right, those jobs are going to be gone. And the people who sat around until August or September, right. they uh, are screwed. And it's such a short And then they're going to want work. more handouts. They're going to right. be like, well, sorry for us. I read a really interesting book by Mike Michalowicz who wrote Profit First. And he described it's about taking your profit first. And you and I have talked about this before you pay your bills. So you're paying yourself first before you pay your bills. And if you think about a tube of toothpaste, when you get to the end of toothpaste, you're squeezing every little bit out of it as you can. And you make that toothpaste last because you don't want to go buy more toothpaste. But at the beginning of that toothpaste, you're just squeezing on, on that wherever. brush, on that brush, you're filling that whole thing all the way up. <laughs> and that's exactly what people do with money. And economics and data have proven that over and over right. and over. And it's happening right now. And it's hard to watch. I just hope people are. Well, I mean, I think we're going to get the nail. We're going to, it's going to hit, right? If it expires in July, a large percentage will go, all right, it's over. And they'll go get, like you said, Phil, all those jobs are gone. Then you're going to have the people that are late every year on their taxes and, you know, they're late to everything. Well, still feel sorry for me. And the number will be huge. Do you think that people who are late on their taxes are late on everything else in their lives? I think so. Not unless. No, I do. Because I'm never late and I'm never late at my taxes. I get my taxes done pretty much the first week in January. (laughs) I saw an image from LinkedIn News today. And the source is LinkedIn Economic Graph Research and Insights. And it's fast gaining jobs in the wake of COVID-19. These j- job titles are listed alphabetically, obviously, because LinkedIn is a job professional a proximity platform. guy. All, all showed rapidly rising presence this year versus pre-coronavirus rates. What are they? It's 12 of them. COVID contact tracer. Uh, I, that was going to be my number one. But it wasn't. You didn't say anything, did you? Well, well I, that was, yeah, all right. No, I Co- was trying to get it out. COVID care yeah. resource coordinator. COVID care resource. Crisis counselor. <gasps> health and safety manager. Life coach. Loan specialist. Medical product sales. Occupancy planner. Online tutor. Personal shopper. Virtual assistant. And my favorite, warehouse worker. Contact. Tracer. Right. Which is what? Of course, it's more government work, isn't it? Well, I mean... Contact tracer. Very controversial. All of our phones got these things put on it. It's like, well, you're more than welcome to turn it off. Yeah, but isn't this thing supposed to like blow over? Well, it doesn't matter if the goalpost keeps moving. If COVID isn't going away, and who knows? Masks aren't going away. What's that going to do to the markets? And what I challenge all of you to do, because tonight's topic, top-down analysis, go back to those longer-range charts, look at pre-COVID, look at the so-called recovery, and then start making some fundamental assumptions that 
what if we all go back into lockdown? What if these people getting extra $600 a week stop getting the spending stops? The real panic starts to hit, right? So use that top-down analysis, make some good assumptions, and who knows? Maybe you could be one of the uh, few people that look back at 2020 and say, that's the year I crushed it in trading and it set you on a path the rest of your life. So next Wednesday, next Wednesday, sorry for enunciation issues, be checking your inbox. I got a big announcement coming out. So it's been a long time in coming. Uh, it's been delayed through COVID, through separation, through moving offices, but the courses are finally ready to be sent out to the public. Now, if you want to be a part of the first round, the promotional pricing, go to allenfx.com. Make sure you are on the email list because we're going to email our loyal listeners and followers, everyone that's reached out to us thus far. We're going to be emailing them on Wednesday. So look in your junk folder. If you're getting the newsletters, and you're, you're already seeing those every week. You have nothing to worry about. But we get really low open rate on those newsletters. I don't know if it's just because Matt is boring or you're just getting it in your spam folder because, you know, we do use a email assistant program to send those out. And sometimes a lot of people's email ends up in junk. So go look for it. Make sure you right click, add us to a safe, safe sender list. You'll get all those all of those uh, newsletters each week and any new promotion. But this Wednesday's big. Be looking for that email with those promotional pricing for all of our listeners. Thank you very much for listening. Please join us next week. Over and out. If you'd like to learn more about Clayton's signals, please visit www.alanfx.com. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram and Telegram at OFPMAP.